Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second of two nights, two opera nights with the Boston Public Library and the Boston Lyric Opera. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Central Library of the Boston Public Library. We're so excited to be here in partnership with the Boston Lyric Opera to bring you tonight's program as a part of our Repairing America series. Tonight, via a discussion and musical performances, we'll explore jazz and other forms of music as they connect with opera. Before we begin though, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Your microphones and cameras are muted in this webinar space. Um, recordings from tonight's program will be available in a couple of weeks on both Opera Box TV and on the BPL's YouTube channel, so you can keep an eye out for that. Closed captioning is enabled, so you can turn it on or off during both the lecture and the Q&A period by using the live transcript button with the CC there on the bottom of your screen. We will also be taking questions for Dr. Tammy Kernodal um, at any time during the program. If you click the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen, you can type your questions in there during any time. And toward the end of the program, we will get to as many of them as we can um, during toward the end of our hour tonight together. So now I'd like to just welcome uh, Rebecca Kirk from the Boston Lyric Opera, who will introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Tammy Kernodal. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you, Kristen. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Kirk, and I'm the Director of Community and Learning for Boston Lyric Opera. On behalf of all of us at BLO, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Opera Night at the BPL Virtual Edition. Our partnership with the Boston Public Library is a cornerstone of our education and community programming as we continue to build increased equity, equity and access for opera for all across the city of Boston and beyond. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Boston Public Library President David Leonard, the Chief of Adult Library Services, Gianna Gifford, and all of the wonderful staff at the library for continuing to support and strengthen this partnership, especially this year. Tonight, in collaboration with the Boston Public Library's Repairing America Initiative, working towards racial equity and recovery, we explore opera in jazz, widening the soundscape of American opera featuring scholar Dr. Tammy L. Kernodal. Dr. Kernodal is a distinguished professor of musicology at Miami University, where she specializes in African American music, American music, and gender studies. She has worked closely with programs, including the Kennedy Center's Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Festival, Jazz at Lincoln Center, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Lecture Series, NPR, and the BBC, to name a few. BLO's 2021 Jane and Stephen Aiken Emerging Artists, Brianna J. Robinson and Nicholas Legess, as well as BLO artist Kristen Carney, will perform opera arias that speak to and illustrate Dr. Kernodal's themes. You may read more about our lecturer and our artists on our website, blo.org. And now I am pleased to welcome our lecturer this evening, Dr. Tammy Kronodal. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'd like to thank um, not only Rebecca, but the Boston Lyric Opera staff, um, their community partners, the Boston Public Library, and of course, the wonderful artists who are going to um, accompany uh, my lecture this evening and offer their artistic renderings of some of this great music. Uh, in framing this particular discussion tonight, I want to take you to Atlanta, Georgia, 1972. It was there in 1972 that a multiracial cast and creative team that consisted of Atlanta Symphony Orchestra conductor Robert Shaw, composer T.J. Anderson, musical director Wendell Whalum, and choreographer and, and director Catherine Dunham, led a collective of singers, dancers, and instrumentalists through the final rehearsals of Scott Joplin's three-act opera, Tremonitia. Tremonitia embodied Joplin's desire to create a distinct form of American opera that would truly be based 
in an American experience. Completed in 1909 at the height of Joplin's celebrated career as one of the main art architects of the ragtime, popular ragtime style. Tremonitia symbolized the expansion of his musical vision. But unfortunately, Joplin would never be able to see its full performance as an opera. And the work only existed as a piano vocal score uh, until it was rediscovered in 1970. But in 1972, fueled by orchestrations um, produced by Dr. T.J. Anderson that were based on Joplin's notated score, coupled with the vision of Wendell, Whalum, Robert Shaw, and Catherine Dumman, Tremonitia premiered in its full form on January 28th and 29th. This performance would be significant in marking the 1970s as a period of significant change in terms of who and what was being heard in the realm of American opera. The opera's libretto and multiple genres of Black vernacular music that were employed throughout this work mark Tremonitia as being a paradigm shifting opera. Its plot centered on the lives of a community of former slaves that inhabited an abandoned plantation in Arkansas in the 1880s. And the opera central character, a young girl named Tremonitia, would come to embody the shifting identity of Black America as it navigated Gilded Age America. Tremonitia's education and ascendancy to leadership within her community was emblematic not only of the ideological debates surrounding Blackwood upward mobility and advancement at the turn of the century, but also came to embody the Mayu, the environment of social change brewing in 1970s in response to this premiere. In Tremonitia, we have Joplin grappling with some of the significant problems and issues of the day. Education versus superstition, American Christianity versus African spirituality and cosmology, resistance versus assimilation. And while ragtime remained a prominent form of popular music during this period in which this opera was completed, Scott Joplin resisted any effort to call this work a ragtime opera. Instead, he employed audiences to experience the vast and diverse sound world that framed the opera storyline. He employed many genres of music that reflected the insularity of the Black community, but also the cultural transference that was taking place as Blacks migrated out of these cultural centers. The spiritual, the folk hymnody of the Second Awakening, syncopated fiddle and banjo tunes all served as important markers of musical Blackness and culture in Tremonition. While we can hear all of these markers throughout this particular opera. One of the strongest representations of this insularity, but also the hybridity that came with migration and experiences uh, outside of the Black community was emphasized particularly in the opera's finale, a chorus number called A Real Slow Drag. It represents the culmination of the drama and the tension of, that is expressed through the libretto of this opera, but also it reflected the communal aspects of black music making that, that framed so much of black life and represented black joy in the midst of trauma and uncertainty. So we will hear <clears throat> 
BLO rising artist as she brings to us a real slow drag. One of the key songs that not only reflects the influence of ragtime in this particular opera, but will also indicate what were some of the European forms of music that inform the compositional identity of Scott Joplin. This is a real slow drag. Thank you, Brianna. In this performance, we can hear how early composers like Scott Joplin attempted to deal with the intricacies of Black vernacular music and, and wedding them to operatic convention. Unfortunately, it would take almost 60 years for us to get a clear picture of how this would be accomplished. But tonight, I wanna take us on a short journey through this complex history of American opera to explore how composers have in many ways stretched and challenged the definitions of what it means to write and perform and even categorize or identify what is a specific strain of American opera. Both the silencing of Scott Joplin and the rediscovery of this work, especially in light of the height of the Black Power movement, reflects in many ways the complex politics that have framed who and what has been heard in America's operatic and concert halls. But what I hope to show or reveal to you, both through performance and lecture, is the ways in which multiple forms of music and the multiple narratives of this American story have now began to frame new understandings of contemporary American opera. Now, to, in order to understand what I am advancing in terms of this notion of American opera, but also the wedding of Black popular music or Black vernacular music with operatic conventions. I think that it is important that we go back and survey a very important period of this idiom's history. In particular, the period of the 1920s to the 1950s. And don't worry, my Baptist sensibilities won't get the better of me tonight and I won't be very long-winded with this. But I think it's very important that in order to understand what I mean by American opera as a specific genre within a larger conception of opera culture is that we, we focus first on the correlation that existed between the emergence of this idiom in a more modern form and its correlation with the Negro Renaissance movement. Now I'm referring to this movement in this way, although most people know it as the Harlem Renaissance, because I really want to represent the diversity um, ideologically, geographically, and culturally that reflected this artistic movement during this period. Harlem was only one cultural outpost of this Renaissance as Chicago and Washington DC, Philadelphia, and later LA and other points in between would also become major um, geographic um, spaces for the cultivation of this um, type of Negro or black art. It was during this period, particularly the height of this movement in the 1930s, that the notion of black opera as a distinct form of American opera began to emerge. As Dr. Naomi Andre um, uh, chronicled in her, her last um, lecture as part of this series, um, Blackness in opera um, was embedded in the works of many different composers, from William Grant Steele to also Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, Clarence Cameron White, and of course, um, Henry um, Freeman. 
But I want to focus specifically on William Grant Steele and one of his earliest experimentations with wedding jazz music with opera. And that comes in the form of the opera Blue Steel, which William Grant Steele is believed to have started writing some point in time around 1930, but, um, but gained momentum in the progression of the work as he moved through 1932, 1933. Blue Steel uh, in many ways um, reflected um, many of the attributes of the Harlem Renaissance or the Negro Renaissance. It showed both mastery of form, the mastery of European grand opera form, and also it reflected the African mood and experience. Uh, drawing on African cosmology, the perspective in which Africans saw themselves in the world, African spirituality in the form of voodoo or hoodoo, but also black history in the diasporic kind of perspective, drawing on not just the American experience, but also the Africans' experiences throughout South America and the Caribbean and on the continent of Africa. It is one of the earliest examples uh, in this case of jazz as a particular genre being invoked in, in the body of this opera. Now, while many might see uh, Scott Joplin's Tremonitia as being a jazz opera in some respects. We must note that um, ragtime has a relationship with jazz, but it is not jazz. It is seen as a predecessor jazz and one of the major musical foundations. But in Blue Steel, we have William Grant Steele drawing on the jazz culture of the time of the 1930s. The opera was set in the backwood swamp. Um, and it, written in three acts, focused on an ill-fated love story that involved an arrogant city dweller by the name of Blue Steel and the daughter of a high priest of a voodoo cult, Neola. It bears all the markers of Steele's engagement with broader contexts of the diasporic culture and the cultural life of Harlem during this period. It points very strongly to how jazz in many ways underscored William Grant Steele's compositional voice during this period. And that should not be surprising to most listeners, considering that Steele had worked by this time as musical director for Black Swan Records, the first black owned recording company in America that recorded not only blues and jazz, but also classical music as well. He had also been part of the production team of Shuffle Along, uh, the historic uh, Broadway musical that launched a renaissance of black Broadway. And for a period in time, he served as one of the staff arrangers for the celebrated band leader, Paul Whiteman. Blue Steel, which was completed one year before Porgy and Bess was ever conceived, provides us a very strong understanding of how this composer and how future comp composers will have to grapple with the improvisatory and often expansive harmonic language of jazz and how that will fit into operatic convention. So I wanna welcome back again, Brianna Robinson, uh, who is now going to perform um, Neola's aria from Blue Steel, Give Me No Body Without Your Soul, um, which will highlight this marriage of jazz and operatic convention. Although Steele would come to discard Blue Steel, um, not pursuing a production, portions of this, this opera um, would find its way into the recital and concert culture of many Black artists during the first half of the 20th century. But what we hear in this aria and what we hear in other extant portions of Blue Steel foreshadows 
what would be Steele's definition, his making, his conception of a, a form of black opera that would ultimately come to break the proverbial glass ceiling that had, had isolated and muted black composers works for mainstream stages. In 1939, he began a collaboration with Langston Hughes that would ultimately um, culminate with the opera Troubled Island, which in 1949 would become the first opera by a black composer to be performed by a major opera company. New York uh, Opera Company um, would premiere this work and would be central over the course of the next few decades in advancing um, new operas, new commissions that would come to embody what was a developing idiom of American opera. But in time, only Porgy and Bess would come to really define for many people in the American sense of opera, this wedding of jazz and um, opera convention. That would somewhat change though, uh, at, in the decades following World War II, and in particular, in the period where I started this lecture in the 1970s. You see, the 1970s is often looked upon by opera scholars and American music scholars as being a period of rebirth or renaissance as it relates to American opera. Now, most scholars frame this rebirth or renaissance around the influential works of composers like Philip Glass and John Adams. But this also came to encompass the works of a generation of black composers and women composers who would be significant in widening the soundscape, but also the narratives and the stories that would come to define American opera during the latter 20th century. And so when we hear now uh, hip hop and contemporary R&B and gospel and jazz in many variant forms being integrated into these storylines that are reclaiming and recapturing aspects of our American history and American experience. We have to point back to this period of the last couple of decades of the 20th century as a means of understanding how we get to this space. And so I think it's important to outline as we move forward some of the factors that were significant in advancing more diverse audiences and an expansion of the narrative of opera during this period in time. Of course, there is the obvious, which is that in the 1970s and 80s, particularly the last three decades of the 20th century, you know, we saw a, a generation of composers that began to challenge what constituted operatic conventions, right? And they challenged this not only musically by drawing on a vast array of genres of music as a basis of style, but also theatrically, so that the lines or the streams of American opera could all oftentimes be blurred with other genres and forms, right? So that musical theater and Broadway and, and what connoted American opera were oftentimes blurred, but also the performance art movement um, also began to blur with opera. And so there is a deconstruction of this Eurocentric notion of opera that is occurring uh, within this context um, in this period. But also what we see is a shifting in the engagement of opera and the infrastructure that propelled opera in America. We first we see that there is a much wider dissemination of opera that is occurring during this period through radio and television and not just simply network television, but we see the emergence 
of uh, what will be the predecessor to uh, public broadcast um, system or PBS. And so um, television and radio will be considerably important in terms of the commissioning of new operas um, that will appeal to vast audiences, right? We also see in this period, the rise of a number of regional opera companies. And so while the Met and, and New York based opera companies never lose their grip as being central articulators of operatic practices in America. There is this decentralization that happens and there is a progression of operatic traditions because of the rise of these regional opera companies who in many cases are going to be central in commissioning new works, right? That are going to speak uh, and reflect these diverse experiences. And so we see a number of regional opera companies emerging in the latter part of the 20th century. We get Seattle Opera in 1962. We get uh, Houston Grand Opera in 1955. And ironically, Houston Grand Opera uh, in 1975 um, also stages Tremonitia. And if you, if you happen to go online to look at performances of Tremonitia, uh, you will more than likely run into uh, excerpts from the 1975 Houston Grand Opera production. But we also get Boston Lyric Opera uh, in 1976, and we get LA Opera in 19. 86. So this is just representative of some of these regional opera companies that begin to commission new works and move beyond the canon of, of European um, operas that are performed in America. But we also see the changing dynamics of music education, particularly on the college and university level. Uh, sh shaping what is also operatic convention to focus not only on the training of young singers and musicians for the professional world, but them also beginning to, um, to engage in the act of um, commissioning new works and workshopping works. So the workshop model uh, became important in terms of the emergence of new experimental uh, operas, chamber operas, um, but also works by lesser known, less established composers, right? Um, and and this, this system um, was quite significant uh, in terms of uh, producing uh, or widening um, the scope of opera during this period in time, largely because unlike professional opera companies who had limitations that were based on ticket prices and, and, and audience development and could not take uh, chances moving beyond some of the standard repertory. Uh, these opera workshops and these music departments were nested within the, uh, the financial fiduciary infrastructure of universities. And so, um, so this level of experimentation with these works, you know, um, uh, did not have the same budgetary constraints, right? And so there are a number of universities and colleges that are spoken, spoken about when, when scholars write about this history, you know, uh, Indiana University, Kansas State, um, some of the California schools, but I also want to mention that there are not just PWIs, predominantly white institutions that are engaged in, in, in the act of opera workshop and the commissioning of, of these new operas. There are some HBCUs that are involved in this as well. And so I really want to mention in particular Opera South, um, which began as a collegiate collective agreement between um, Utica Community College was an HBCU um, community-based college. And by what I mean by HBCU is historical black college, uh, Tugelo um, College, and also Jackson State College. And so these three universities um, came together and much like PWIs, um, they began to, um, to, to, um, to promote 
um, these um, new operas, new works, put on productions of works, right? And so um, while they, they initially were not called Opera South, that name uh, materialized largely because there was no real Southern based opera company at the time. And so it meshed professional lead singers that were sung with students that worked as extras, as members of chorus, but also part of the production staff. So this was significant. And the last thing that we see happening in this period is the emergence of a number of nonprofit theatrical organizations. Uh, who much like these opera workshops within these universities were significant in providing a space for uh, future productions and the development of operas. And I want to mention in particular the American Musical Theater in Philadelphia, which was founded in 1984, because that particular um, entity was significant in, um, in helping develop some of the operas that I'm going to talk about in this, this last part of this lecture, right? And so when we look at the widening soundscape of late 20th century opera, um, some of this can be tied to all of these things, but most importantly, the American Musical Theater was significant in that. So through the American Musical Theater, we get gospel at Colonus, you know, so we see gospel being utilized in this, this uh, operatic tradition. Uh, we get uh, Philip Glass's Hydrogen Jukebox. It's performed only in a concert version um, through this organization. But also we, we get the, the earliest performances of the two operas I want to focus on um, in, in this part of the lecture. One being Duke Ellington's Queenie Pie, the other being Anthony Davis's X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X. And so I'm invoking these two operas because in many ways they really point to um, how uh, a generation of Black composers are really um, conceptualizing opera as a tool for telling um, new and different stories within um, this this particular social moment or social period. But they also are reflective of the politics that surround the liberation ideologies of the civil rights and the black power movement. Both of these movements and their, uh, their subsequent cultural movements that grow out within them um, precipitated the emergence of not only uh, new levels of black art, but also precipitated the advancement of black historiography that looked at reclaiming, resituating, and expanding understanding about the Africans' experience in America and the diaspora. And so through this advancement of this historiography, there's much more of an expansive conversation about slavery, about reconstruction, about the impact and the influence of the first waves of the great migration and about black life in general. But also we see the reclaiming of particular figures and characters and themes that are not being dealt with in any measured way in mainstream popular culture but are embedded in the fabric of the cultural arts of, of the Black community. And so when we look at these two operas and we look at these composers, Duke Ellington and Anthony Davis, they both provide us a context for understanding uh, not only how jazz is operating within this paradigm of, of grand opera, and in the case of, of Duke Ellington, comic opera, but they're also providing us a way of understanding how this, this embedding of American experience and African-American experience becomes part of this narrative of the concert hall and the operatic stage. 
1970, just before the time in which I began this lecture talking about Tremonitia, Edward Kennedy, who's better known as Duke Ellington, was commissioned um, by the ne National Education uh, Teacher uh, Television, National Educational Television Commission to write a opera for TV. Uh, the NET, uh, as I stated earlier, was the predecessor of, of a PBS, what is now PBS. And part of its programming was its opera theater, um, where it showcased uh, new operas that would be accessible to its audiences and its people. Uh, and so Duke Ellington began to conceptualize in the early 1970s uh, an opera that he titled Queenie Pie. Now, let me just say, this is not Ellington's um, first notions or thoughts about writing opera. In fact, um, it, as early as the 1930s, we have Duke Ellington expressing an interest in writing an opera. In particular, he was taken by the story of Madam C.J. Walker, um, the first black female millionaire in America who transformed the beauty industry um, and, and hair care for black women. Um, but so in, in the 1970s, uh, those seeds that were germinating um, in those previous decades started to become the basis of the story of what he called a comic opera called Queenie Pie. And, and so for the course of the next three years of his life, he began sketching out portions of this opera, Queenie Pie. Unfortunately, Ellington would never come to finish the opera. Uh, he died in 1974, and what was left was best mainly sketches, um, a, 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 a plot not fully developed, but centered around a storyline uh, that was based on uh, a, a beautician, a Harlem-based beautician by the name of Queenie Pie, uh, you know, who had become a celebrated figure in her community, who was a beauty queen. Uh, and her ultimate um, tension, her ultimate um, um, kind of, uh, of infighting with a younger, uh, lighter skinned woman that he named Cafe Olay. So you, you, you have this, this kind of invoking of comedy through some of these names, right? And so it, it becomes this, this um, story that is centered around mortality, around love, unrequited love, around colorism. That was something that was not really being talked about openly uh, within mainstream America. And it also had this kind of fantasy, surristic side of it, uh, where, you know, Queenie Pie goes off to this magical island and, and finds this um, formula, right? A beauty formula that, that um, somewhat transforms her, her, her um, social space back in the community. And so for years, Queenie Pie just simply existed in this kind of um, unrecognized form. But in 1985, Maurice uh, Prentice, the conductor, as well as Mercer Cunningham, uh, Mercy, Mercer Ellington, excuse me, began working on trying to develop Queenie Pie into a fully realized opera. Now, over the past uh, 40 years, this has continued. And I, and I say 40 years encompassing, you know, Ellington's first real iteration of this, right? So you've had over, over all of these years, different individuals who have tried to come together and to piece together what was really just a multitude of ideas and fragments into a fully realized opera. Uh, the first performance was actually given at the American Musical Theater um, and involving Mercer Ellington and Maurice Prentice. Um, but the most recent um, connotations of Queenie Pie 
who have been done by a number of university-based as well as professional opera companies has been based on the work of jazz arranger uh, Mark Bolin. And so we're going to hear the opening number from Queenie Pie, uh, which is a course number um, called New York, New York, but it has been reconceptualized in a piano vocal version, which is largely what um, many of those fragments that Duke Ellington left uh, upon his death, that's what the score is essentially encompassed. So this is the opening number. So I'm happy to welcome uh, Nicholas Leguess, um, who is the, the artist that will be performing New York, New York. So listen for the fullness, and I want you to try to imagine the Ellington Orchestra, the horns, the riffs, those ideas that were emblematic of the Ellington sound being part of this vocal moment, New York, New York. So we can imagine had Duke Ellington been able to complete this opera um, fully what would have been a, a, a fully realized jazz opera. Uh, we do not get this fully realized jazz opera until we get to 1985 and we get to Anthony Davis. Um, a significant figure in terms of the advancement of, of uh, American opera and Black opera in this period in time. Last year, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his critical opera, the Central Park Five based on that landmark case. And if, if I can speak anything about what Anthony Davis has brought to opera, it has been the reclaiming, the resituating of, of black historical figures and, and, and black historical tropes within the, the, the concert hall. And this all begins with the opera X the life and times of Malcolm X, which in 1985 was significant in reclaiming Malcolm X's identity um, for what had been constructed um, in the years following his assassination in 1965. Uh, it is a three act opera that looks at, at the, um, the evolution of Malcolm X as a figure um, from Malcolm Little in his early years and the trauma involved in uh, his early years that marked him um, and his difference of race. And then there is, is Malcolm X and his, his evolution to Detroit Red, a hustler and a drug dealer uh, that ultimately ends in, up in prison and converts to Islam. And through that becomes one of the main voices of the black liberation movement of the 1960s, espousing not the assimilationist politics of Dr. King um, and, and his branch of the movement, but, but promoting a black nationalist um, rhetoric that was centered in black consciousness that was was African centered and not through the gaze of, of Europe and Eurocentric culture. Here in, in Anthony Davis's operas and not just X in the life and times, we hear the many influences that he brings uh, as a composer. And he calls these kind of polarities of sound, but we, we hear a fully realized vision for how jazz works and operates as an improvisatory form um, within the, the, the kind of restrictions of opera, right? And so we have him um, drawing on, particularly in X, um, a multitude of, of jazz styles from the avant-garde to the rhythms and the idioms of swing and bebop, right? Um, but also vocally reflecting um, the fluidity of jazz and the improvisatory nature of the way in which the voice operates in jazz, often employing scat, um, but also utilizing the language of jazz, jive, the form of urban Black vernacular culture, right, that became um, the language of jazz and ultimately hipster culture in America. 
Uh, there are two examples that I want to draw on tonight that I really think embodies how Anthony Davis um, reflects um, this expansion of sound, but also provides a template for a, a, a whole new wave of, of composers who are looking to, to wed these different forms of popular culture uh, within these narratives of American opera. And in particular, I point to Terrence Blanchard, whose champion um, will be performed by Bl a Boston Lyric Opera soon, but also Okoya's um, Harriet Tubman, um, or look at the opera Charlie Parker, or we look at Margaret Garner, right? We look at these operas that are embedding all of the sound within the narratives of black life, not separating black music from a lived black experience, but utilizing it as a way of amplifying what are these stories that are being told. And so the first example I, um, I want to pull on is Streets Aria, which comes at, um, comes in act one, scene two. And at this point in the opera, what we have is Malcolm X living in Boston and him encountering um, this character street who is really an amalgamation of every hustler, uh, every you know kind of street figure um, that is explored throughout um, Alex Haley's wonderful book, the autobiography of Malcolm X, right? And so in this in this aria, what we we hear is how Anthony Davis embeds uh, jazz, which would have been a part of the of the energy and the soundscape of this particular scene in a pool hall, right? Uh, and in the streets and utilizing that as a way of, of, in many ways, marking the evolution of Malcolm X, right? Of Malcolm Little, excuse me, into Detroit Red, um, this hustler figure, right? And so um, I want to welcome, uh, I want to welcome this artist into the space um, uh, who is going to perform for us street uh, aria. Uh, this is Christian Carney, um, and I want we we won't get to hear unfortunately all of the scat elements in this particular example, um, but but you will hear uh, how Anthony Davis embed, embeds some of these uh, sound markers of jazz, walking bass line, very intricate harmonies uh, associated with bebop. So this is Streets Aria. Uh, this is Christian Carney. The second example from uh, Anthony Davis's X um, comes from the end of Act One, which marks uh, a point where Malcolm, uh, now as Detroit Red, begins to uh, unpack uh, what has been the historical narrative of trauma in his life. I'm offering up this example uh, to show that while we look at opera in some respects for what it can offer us in, in terms of understanding uh, uh, these new sounds, these new musical genres that are being employed, uh, Anthony Davis's operas and, and many other uh, contemporary composers have compelled us to take into account through their libretto and their stories, uh, what has been a history of pain, what has been a history of perseverance, what has been a, a history of transference that marks this American experience, particularly the experiences of Black people in America. Now, I want to warn you that this aria, which is entitled Malcolm's Aria, which it takes place in a police station where he is being interrogated after um, being arrested during a robbery um, can be very triggering, uh, especially in light of our current um, culture I'll, and what we have seen over the course of the last year with George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. 
Uh, this again is Nicholas Legess, who is going to present to us Malcolm's Aria, which for me aligns with the culture of realism that we now hear expressed in many of our contemporary operas. So in closing, I hope that these arias, these excerpts, and these operas that have been explored uh, provide some understanding of how uh, in the last three decades of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century, how black composers have in many ways challenged the very limited definitions that have been used previously to define the idiom of American opera but how they have also expanded our soundscape and our understanding of what historically defines this experience in the Opera House. Thank you. And please join me in thanking Brianna Robinson, uh, Kristen um, Carney, and also Nicholas Legess for their rendering of this wonderful music tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kernel, and thank you very much, artists, um, for that informative presentation and conversation. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, I would like to also thank everyone who asked questions. We didn't have a chance to get to those tonight, but thank you for submitting those. Thank you to the Boston Lyric Opera and to our combined production team behind the scenes. And if you'd like to learn more about upcoming programs at the Boston Public Library, please visit bpl.org events. And in particular, you may be interested in our upcoming summer concert series in the courtyard. Thank you for joining us this evening. Be well, good night.